African prophet, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, and the African American prophetic tradition that won the 2013 uh, African American Communication and Cultural Diversity Outstanding Book Award. He is the editor of Urban God Talk, Construction, Constructing a Hip Hop Spirituality. He also serves as the founder and managing editor of the popular Rhetoric, Race, and Religion blog, and as general editor of the Rhetoric, Religion rhetoric race and religion book series uh, with Lexington Books. He is a co-author with Amanda Neal Edgar of The Struggle Over Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, which won the 2019 African American Communication and Cultural Division Outstanding Book Award. His latest book, No Future in This Country, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner and the African American Prophetic Tradition has a release date of um, November 2020, so it's already out. And as some of you who have been on here early and know that uh, uh, the public got it before he did. <laughs> <laughs> we also have uh, Dr. Jean Lee Cole, a professor of English at Loyola, Loyola University, Maryland, where she teaches courses in American literature from the 19th century to the present. Uh, she, is the off, she is the editor of Freedom's Witness, the Civil War Correspondence of Henry McNeil Turner, and the co-editor of Zora Neale Hurston, Collected Plays. Her most recent book is uh, How the Other Half Laughs, The Comedic Sensibility in American Culture, 1895 to 1920. Um, and James Morgan um, III is a graduate of Howard University, where he studied mass communication and African-American history. He is a Prince Hall Freemason and currently serves as the Grand Historian and Archivist of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia. Mr. Morgan's research primarily focused on uh, the African-American fraternal experience in the 19th century and genealogy. He is a member of uh, African-American fraternal experience in the, excuse me, he's a member of the African-American Genealogical Historical Society. Uh, I have vision problems here. In 2018, he published a research paper entitled Like a Voice Crying in the Wilderness, The Masonic Life of Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. He has penned and contributed to several published works, including his debut book, The Lost Empire, Black Freemasonry in the Old West, 1867 to 1906, which was awarded the 2019 Dr. Charles H. Wesley Medal of History and the 2020 Phyllis Wheatley Book Award uh, for Nonfiction Biography. Um, so I will give um, each speaker uh, 10 minutes to um, basically uh, present. And um, if you have any questions, if you're listening in, please be sure to put them in the chat line or hold on to them until we get to the discussion part and we'll open it up for you to ask um, your questions. So without further ado, let's take it away, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Don, uh, for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to be here uh, with my good friends. Uh, Professor Cole and Brother James Morgan. And I am, again, honored and privileged to uh, be a part of this wonderful um, symposium and to kick off um, this wonderful series um, being hosted by the African American um, Civil War Memorial and Museum. Uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, um, the new book, uh, No Future. Uh, and I would do it in this way here. In 1902, author and lecturer D.W. Cupp published 20th Century Negro Literature or the Cyclopedia of Thoughts on the vital topics relating to the American Negro. Cupp collected essays from 100 African Americans addressing different topics um, pertinent to African Americans at the turn of the 20th century. Now, among the intellectuals Cupp invited to submit an essay was Bishop Henry McNeil Turner. Cup asked him and three other prominent African-Americans to address the question, will it be possible for the Negro to attain in this country unto the American type of civilization? The three other uh, authors um, took a more conservative or moderate tone in answering their question. But Bishop Turner uh, interrogated the merits of the question. Uh, he argued, civility comprehends harmony, system, method, complacency, urbanity, refinement, politeness, uh, courtesy, justice, culture, general enlightenment, and protection of life and person to any man, regardless of his color or nationality. It is enough for a civilized community to know that you are a human being, to pledge surety to, of physical and political safety to you, 
And this has been the sequence in all ages among civilized people. But such is not the condition of things that they apply to this country, I mean the United States. Further, Toner wrote that no savage nation can exceed the atrocities which are often heralded through the country and accepted by many as an incidental consequence. Men, he continued, are hung, shot, and burnt by bands of marauders who are almost invariably represented as the most influential and respectable citizens of the community. While the evidences of guilt of what is charged against the victims who are so inhumanely outraged are never established by proof in any court. And all we can learn about the guilt and horrible deeds charged upon the murder victims come from the mouth of a blooded handed wretch who perpetrate the murders, yet they are not known according to published accounts. Then Turner turns back to the question of the essay. Such being the barbarous condition of the United States, he surmised, and the low order of civilization which controls its institutions right where, uh, where right and justice should sit in throne, I see nothing for the Negro to attain unto this country. Further, he wrote that he did not see anything for African-Americans to aspire to. He could return to Africa, he lamented, especially to Liberia where a Negro government is already in existence and learned the elements of civilization. In fact, for human life is sacred there. No man is deprived of it or any other thing that involves manhood without due process of law. So my decision is that there is nothing in the United States for the Negro to learn or try to attain to. And I lift that up because that was the point where I began to um, make the argument that Turner is not always this pessimistic, wasn't always this pessimistic. His treatment of the question, his skeptical skepticism of America's being a civilized nation, the description of abuses facing by faced by African Americans, his use of language that was meant to shock and provoke and his overall tone and dismissive nature toward the goodness of America provide an example of a writer adopting a prophetic persona and using prophetic rhetoric. Now in the first book, The Forgotten Prophet, I noted four types of prophetic rhetoric, the celebratory prophecy, uh, prophetic disputation, a mission-oriented prophet, uh, prophecy, but in this book, No Future, I highlighted the uh, pessimistic prophecy or the prophetic lament. Because for many black orators, finding the racism to entrench in the American covenant ideas not realistic for black Americans to attain, they become wailing and moaning prophets within the lament tradition of prophecy. In this tradition, the prophet's primary function is to speak out on the behalf of others and to chronicle their pain and suffering as well as their own. By speaking, the prophet offers hope and encouragement to others by acknowledging their sufferings and letting them know that they are not alone. Roughly the last 20 years of his life, Turner had no confidence in American institutions or that the American people would live up to the promises outlined in their sacred documents. While he argued that immigration was the only way for African-Americans to retain their quote, personhood status, he would also come to believe that African-Americans would never immigrate to Africa. He argued that many African-Americans were so oppressed, so stripped of agency, surrounded by continued negative assessments of their personhood, that belief in immigration was not possible. Turner's position limited his rhetorical options, but by adopting a pessimistic prophetic voice, he bore witness to the atrocities African-Americans face. Thus, I argued that Turner became the wailing and moaning prophet whose primary function was to speak out on behalf of others and to chronicle their pain and suffering. Consistent with the lament tradition, Turner did not expect anything racism, lynching, and all the other problems after African-Americans faced to change. His goal was simply to speak and to get his audience to hear. Turner's pessimism and rhetorical laments caused him, of course, to lose much of his support. After the death of Frederick Douglass in 1895, many thought Turner was poised to take Douglass's leadership mantle. However, Turner's prophetic call kept that from happening. 
his strong positions against the Supreme Court, which I cover in chapter one, his ever-changing and at, right, uh, at times radical theological approaches, chapter two, his anti-war position I take up in chapter three, his public support of the then Democratic nominee, William Jennings Bryan in chapter four, his consistent push for immigration, chapter five, and his damning of America, chapter six, was just too much. Add to this the invectives aim at African-American leaders and the constant infighting with other bishops and leaders of his church, and one begins to understand why many had disdain and utter contempt for Bishop Turner. However, as I also argue in the book, Turner laments and prophetic pessimism were all the more relevant to study because they differ from much of the African-American rhetoric during this period. Regardless of whether they were assimilationist or integrationist responses or ones of accommodation, these responses had embedded in them one similar feature, a hope for a bright and glorious future for Blacks in America. This bright future found resonance in the oft-promoted successes grounded in the rhetoric of what historian Ibram Kende calls uplift suasion gained by Black sense emancipation, successes that included property ownership, educational achievements, number of businesses open and maintained, and the religious advancement of African Americans. This is not to say that African American assimilationists, integrationalists, or accommodationalist leaders did not mention the struggles and suffering that took place within the African American community. They were just not the focus of much of their rhetoric. Turner, on the other hand, not only highlighted the pain and suffering of African Americans, but also made it the focus of his rhetoric. This focus fit within the lament tradition of prophecy, a tradition that could house Turner's bitterness and anger both with the system and uh, both within the system that will not allow Blacks to take part in what he argued to be the apathetic nature of many Black leaders. At the same time, it gave Turner a voice as a pessimistic prophet who declared there is no manhood future in the United States for the Negro. In addition, Turner's prophetic pessimism allowed him to become more philosophical that led him to offer a deep penetrating analysis of the current situations facing America, African Americans. For example, while many scholars recognize Du Bois as the father of black identity studies because of his often cited double consciousness phrase, Turner was first, first saw how a flawed construction of identity could be detrimental to African Americans. Grounded in his prophetic pessimism, Turner saw what social scientists and cultural critics would acknowledge in the 20th century, years later, that segregation had an injurious effect upon African Americans. It was Turner's prophetic pessimism and bearing witness to the ills faced by many African Americans during this time that gave many African Americans a sense of pride and the courage necessary to face whatever came their way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson. Um, again, everybody, uh, if you have any questions, um, keep them in your head. And uh, when we get to the discussion part, um, we'll allow you some time as to ask um, Dr. Johnson some questions. Um, so we are going to move on to uh, Dr. Cole. Um, OK, so I have some slides. Um, Edwin, I don't, I'm not able to share. Okay, I should be able to do that now. Okay. It's working. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, first I just want to thank um, James and, and the African American um, Civil War Museum for inviting me to this great symposium. Um, Dr. Johnson and I have actually been acquainted for some years and we've always talked about how we needed to kind of get together and, and do our thing together. So it's really great to have this opportunity to share the stage with him and then also with, with James, um, who I've known for also some time and have, we've all been talking about how we could possibly meet. So um, I'm very grateful. Uh, so my research on Henry McNeil Turner actually um, focuses on his 
life and career before he became bishop of the AME Church. So uh, I know the symposium is called the you know the symposium for Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, and I feel a little bit like an interloper because I'm actually talking about his life before that. And um, so my work has really focused on his rise to public prominence, both as a correspondence to the Christian Recorder newspaper and as a chaplain of the first U.S. colored troops during the Civil War. So that's what I'll be speaking about today, and I'll end with some reflections about his importance to the development of African American literature. Um, I think kind of dovetailing with some of the comments that um, Dr. Johnson just made. So let's see, can I figure out how to do this? So when I first read Turner's words, I actually had no idea who he was. I first discovered him in the Christian Recorder, the newspaper of the AME Church based in Philadelphia. At the time, I was reading an early African-American novel by Julia C. Collins called The Curse of Caste, which was serialized in the Recorder in 1862 and had never been published in book form. In addition, eventually is out, it is out now. It was published in 2006 by Oxford University Press and edited by William Andrews and Mitch Kachin. So you can look for that. As I was reading installment after installment on blurry microfilm, and I just give you an example on the slide here of the kind of uh, type I was <laughs> having to read. Um, my eyes kept being caught by words, the next column over from- I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Cole, I'm sorry, Dr. Cole, I mean, I'm sorry to interrupt. You might want to hit the swap displays button there on, on the top of your presentation. Yeah, it'll make it easier oh, okay. For folks to see. Is that good? Yeah, I think you're seeing my presenter view, okay. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm um, not used to this pre presenter view. Okay, so um, yeah, so you can see how blurry the type is. And so I was reading Julia Collins's novel week after week, and um, and as I was reading it, my eyes kept being caught by words the next column over, words like timberhead, flim flam, the diabolical flag flagitiousness, snake hearted squatter smatters, hydrophobic dropsy headed oligarchy. I, I discovered that these words and columns were all by the same writer who initially was identified only by his initials, HMT. I eventually discovered that HMT was Henry McNeil Turner, the man who would later become Bishop of the AME Church. But at this time, he was an energetic, hopeful young man with eyes wide open and pen at the ready. Mm -hmm. Turner wrote some 90,000 words for the recorder in the years preceding and during the Civil War, and his columns provide an unprecedented eyewitness account of the debates that raged around emancipation in Congress in a Capitol building that was still under construction, later on, and then later on the front lines of the war. As one of the first chaplains of the U.S. Army, he dodged cannon and grape as he put it, with the rest of the soldiers. He was afraid he would drown at sea. He consoled his brave boys as they lay dying and wrote letters to update their wives, their fathers, and their mothers of their recovery or lamented their deaths. He taught his soldiers how to read and collected hundreds, if not thousands of books, Bibles, and newspapers for them. He preached on the battlefield in the homes of free black people in town courthouses. He preached in the courthouses, much to the chagrin of defeated white Southerners who found the mere sight of him at the lectern, he related, quote, as much gospel as they could swallow in one week, unquote. As his voice became known, and as he came to know his own voice, the columns became more journal than journalism. Those accustomed to his later more pessimistic writings, as Dr. Johnson has just discussed, would be surprised at the humor, frequently self-deprecating, that surfaced in Turner's columns. Some of his most memorable scenes depicted black soldiers marching through the vanquished South in the closing months of the war. In one instance, he described how his company took crossing a river near, Smith, near Smithfield, North Carolina, as an opportunity to bathe. He writes, quote, I was much amused to see the secesh, which is short for secessionist, women watching with the utmost intensity, thousands of our soldiers in a state of nudity. They thronged the windows, porticos and yards in the finest attire imaginable. Our brave boys would disrobe themselves, hang their garments upon their bayonets and through the water they would come, walk up the street and seem to say to the feminine gazers, 
Yes, though naked, we are your masters. Later, he was distinctly unimpressed by the unkempt appearance and lawless behavior of General Sherman's troops, saying dismissively, quote, I do not regard it as the army of America. That is all I will now say, wait and see for yourself, unquote. During the final month of the Civil War in April 1865, Turner wrote in amazement, I have seen war wonders. Turner's emphasis on the war's wonders points to the significance of these early writings as the work of the imagination, as assertions of free black selfhood and as opportunities for ministry. From the get-go, Turner's boisterous and at times bombastic diction and syntax leap off the page. He is a lover of syllables and lists, of hyperbole and excess. His sentences spill over the rules of grammar. He respects few rules of literary decorum. He mixes biblical, legal, political, and scientific language with down-home slang, along with words that have no meaning at all. And why not? He once declared, quote, good nonsense is not unfrequently appreciated as our most interesting literature, unquote. One can see in his writing the effect of his unconventional education. He began his reading when he worked in lawyer's offices and did not study grammar until he undertook formal schooling in 1858, only a few years before he began writing for the recorder. In his columns, we, we can see a writer reveling in and stretching the limbs of his own literacy. As a stylist, Turner owes much to the Methodist divines who traveled the South Carolina upcountry where he grew up. He essentially learned at the knee of these black preachers, some illiterate, some learned, who depended heavily on memorization and improvisation to gain converts. The improvisational aspects of black sermonizing have their roots in West African griot storytelling traditions and African influenced dances and songs like the ring shout and the spiritual that infuse African-American religious practice. Conjoined with the evangelical aim of bringing souls to Christ, the preacher used his, and in a few cases her, charisma, passion, creativity, and sheer vocal power to inspire and ultimately convert the congregation into new life. James Weldon Johnson wrote in 1927 that the black preacher, quote, knew the secret of oratory, that at bottom it is a progression of rhythmic words more than it is anything else. Indeed, I have witnessed congregations moved to ecstasy by the rhythmic intoning of sheer inco incoherencies. His imagination was bold and unfettered." End quote. The importance of, of orality, rhythm, and music are distinctive sty stylistic characteristics of the sermon. As an expressive form, it has contributed to African-American literature as much as the blues or jazz. Turner is a quintessential example of an authoritative voice, which historian Dixon Bruce describes as a, quote, black voice with a special authority that was a product of its own blackness, unquote. And it emerged in a newspaper, The Christian Recorder, that thanks to the work of Francis Smith Foster, Eric Gardner, and others, has become recognized as an important birthplace of African-American literature. In a fundamental way, the recorder and other African-American periodicals helped define the outlines of what Carla Peterson has called the ethnic public sphere of African-American society, a sphere that was wider than the domestic sphere of the family, as well as localized ethnic communities, but distinct from the national public sphere. That is to say, they created a distinctly African-American community. Likely because of its religious affiliation, the recorder has not received the same level of scholarly attention as abolitionist journals. In particular, Frederick Douglass's The North Star and Frederick, Doug and Frederick Douglass's paper. In fact, however, it was the longest lived African-American newspaper and likely was read at least as widely, if not more so than Douglass's. The recorder contained a lot more than news and addressed many subjects that had nothing to do with religion. Frequently including poetry and fiction, it was a veritable fountainhead for African-American literature in the 19th century. And I maintain that Turner was one of early African-American literature's most interesting and innovative authors. The Recorder and other African-American periodicals were crucial for the development of African-American literature because they were written by black people for black people. 
As such, works published there, including Turner's Civil War writings, provide an excellent counterpoint to slave narratives, which were written for a largely white audience and were frequently ghost written, or as they put it, edited by white abolitionists. By presenting African Americans as authors, speakers, and commentators on the world around them for a black audience that was assumed to be thoughtful, engaged, and literate, black periodicals created a space for African American discourse that exists outside white control and outside the white gaze. In his unbending assertion of black selfhood, his flights of eloquence, and his sheer magnetism, Turner can be placed on a trajectory of militant dissent against white supremacy that begins at least with David Walker's appeal to the colored citizens of America from 1828 and continuing through Martin Delaney, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, and Black Lives Matter. In his Civil War columns, we witness an authoritative voice and an indefatigable defender of Black humanity and civil rights. Thank you. Thank you so much on that. Um, and last but not least, we have uh, James Morgan, um, who will be speaking next. Um, thank you, Dr. Chitty. Um, man, to follow two of uh, people who I consider friends and mentors uh, and profound scholars in their own rights. Uh, I'm just hoping that I do not disappoint. Um, so I'm going to. Um, so, um, James, before you get started, yes, can I get Dr. Cole to um, send back the control? Let me see. Dr. Cole, you know how to do that? No, I got, I got it on my, I got it right okay. here. Okay, you're all good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Excellent. Can I, can I get the share screen uh, capability, please? One second, hold on. All right. Well, well, well while we're waiting, um, I just want to say very quickly, um, again, thank you to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Cole for participating with us this evening. Um, the way that I came to the study of the life of, uh, of Bishop Henry McNeil Turner was actually quite interesting. I, I first remember learning about him in a, um, in a class I, that I used to TA for when I was at Howard University on, uh, on black education in America. And at that time at Howard, we actually had a, um, uh, a, a, there was a picture of Bishop Turner that used to be at the bottom stairwell of the Moreland Spingarn Research Center for those who, who are familiar with that, with that uh, facility. And I used to walk past it every day and had no idea of the importance of just of who this man, uh, Bishop Turner was. Um, I don't know that we mentioned it earlier, probably should have been the first thing that we mentioned, but uh, Bishop Turner was actually born on February the 1st, 1834, uh, down in South Carolina. And for those of you who don't have a cal calendar handy, I'll let you know that today is Bishop Turner's 187th birthday. And so, I, and I imagine that we may be the only group of people trying to throw Bishop Turner a birthday party tonight. And I do hope that he is uh, pleased. Um, I'm not gonna rehearse over all the information uh, about his life uh, that's already been done, um, except to say that um, for, for the purpose of my research, one of the things that was very important uh, to understand Bishop Turner's life and the importance of Freemasonry in it was the fact that in 1858, uh, he goes on this uh, speaking tour from South Carolina through Georgia, Alabama, and New Orleans. And um, most scholars will understand that this is the uh, birth of Bishop Turner's life in the AME denomination. But that goes hand in hand with his introduction to Prince Hall Freemasonry. Uh, when he gets to Mobile, Alabama, he uh, meets with Simon S. Ash, who's known as the father of Prince Hall Freemasonry in that state, uh, who also becomes a grandmaster there. Uh, and then when he gets to um, to New Orleans, uh, he gets to the St. James AME Church in New Orleans, where he's introduced to the AME denomination. But it's very important to understand that from the beginning of African Methodism with, uh, with Bishop Richard Allen as its founder, that Prince Hall Freemasonry was always uh, an underlying current. Uh, Bishop Allen, along with his uh, good friend, uh, the great uh, Reverend Absalom Jones, uh, was one of the earliest African-American Freemasons, as well as, well as uh, a, the father of African Methodism. Um, in, do, in becoming a Freemason and becoming a Prince Hall Freemason at that, 
uh, being descended from the African Lodge of Boston, uh, Bishop Allen consciously or unconsciously infused the AME denomination's leadership with what I call uh, a twin sister approach to community organizing, which was the public face, meaning uh, the ministry, the community service that they were doing, and then the private face of uh, being involved in Prince Hall Freemasonry and um, organizing on levels that weren't always necessarily visible to the dominant culture. Um, and I think it's very important that we understand that. So when Bishop Turner arrives to St. James AME Church, that church itself would not have existed had it not been in part for Prince Hall Freemasonry. Let me, let me prove it to you. So early AME circuit riding ministers were very important to the spread of the church, but they were also likewise very important to the spread of Prince Hall Freemasonry. Uh, here we see three men who, whether they knew it or not, would become very important to Bishop Turner's um, early life uh, in, in the AME ministry. Uh, Reverend Jordan W. Early, who was an early AME um, uh, preacher who used to travel west and south. He actually uh, used to, at one point was posted to New Orleans, Louisiana for a short period of time. And he informed the brothers there, many of whom wanted to have an AME church now, as well as have a Masonic Lodge same thing for them. Um, he informed them that they should really think about organizing uh, the lodge there and not just talk about it. Um, eventually they would get uh, that church established and Reverend Willis Revels, who actually is the man who would introduce Bishop Turner to the denomination, uh, he becomes the pastor there at one point. And for those who recognize that last name, Reverend Willis Revels is the older brother of the sen of Senator uh, Hiram Revels, who was also an AME minister, okay? But let's start with the beginning of the St. James AME Church for a second and understand that that church was established by none other than Reverend Thomas W. Stringer, who was an AME minister, and at the time, in the early 1840s, was a district deputy grand master for what was known as the, for what today is known as the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. At that time, it was going under a different name, the first independent African Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Um, Reverend Stringer was endowed with powers as a Mason and as an elder in the, min in the AME ministry to establish a church, to set up what would, what was, what would become St. James, but also to set up uh, the first Masonic Lodge in the state of Louisiana in the 1840s. Okay, so, so here is a perfect example of this dual affiliation that we see. So literally the church that Bishop Turner goes into, Prince Hall Freemasonry, is infused into the very DNA of that uh, of that church. Um, I was very fortunate in doing my research on Turner's life in Freemasonry. Uh, and I guess, you know, fortunate also to be the grand historian of, of, of Washington, DC, and that I have access to our minutes. And in our minutes of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the District of Columbia, I uncovered what I believe to be the oldest account of Bishop Turner's involvement in Freemasonry. Now, prior to this, we knew he was a Mason, and I'll show you that later on, but this is an even earlier account than what was already known at that time, and this is going back to 2017, 2018. The document that you see here uh, is dated May 4th, 1869. Um, you may see the 5869, but that's Masonic time, but it's really 1869 as far as the, the public calendar is concerned. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this document is from the minutes of an event that was very important for us here. It's the establishment of Meridian Lodge number six, which uh, is a lodge that still exists today. Uh, and all it's basically saying is that the lodge meeting was opening, but there where you see I underlined, it says brother H.M. Turner of Morningstar Lodge, that square means lodge, Morningstar Lodge number 11 at Portsmouth, Virginia was admitted as a visitor with the usual Masonic honors. So there's a couple of things here that are, are, are uh, implicated that may not be uh, um, obvious to the average observer. Number one, the fact that Bishop Turner is admitted on May 4th, 1869, shows us that he had to have been a, ma a master mason, uh, a member of the Masonic fraternity prior to that date, right? That sounds simple enough. Now, the fact that he was a member of Morning Star Lodge number 11 in Portsmouth, Virginia is very important for, for one big reason. The fact is that Portsmouth number 11, which today is known as, uh, excuse me, uh, Morningstar number 11, which is today Morningstar number three under the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Virginia. At that time, it was number 11 under the role of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge 
of Maryland. And those of us who know anything about Bishop Turner's story understand that once he became an AME minister, he was posted to Baltimore, Maryland. And so even though that lodge is in Virginia, there's that affiliation with Maryland. But, let, but wait a second, what was Bishop Turner doing in Portsmouth, Virginia? What, where, where, where would this come into play in his life? We have to understand his civil war service. So there's many levels and many layers that to unpack when we're dealing with this. And I'm not gonna pretend that I have all the answers, but there are still many layers and many questions that we have that we need to, um, to deal with on Bishop Turner's life in Freemasonry. And I was proud to be able to at least start that conversation. Um, Later on in Turner's career, uh, once we get into uh, the era of reconstruction, uh, we find that Turner was very successful at establishing lodges, I mean, excuse me, establishing churches, ooh, I almost said lodges, at establishing churches uh, throughout the South. But one place in particular where he had a hard time was in the state of North Carolina. And it's very interesting when you look at the history as to why that was the case. The reason why was because the AME Zion Church uh, was uh, became very successful there in part because a man by the name of Bishop J. W. James W. Hood was in some in some instances following behind Turner. Turner would set up an AME church. Hood would come and give his speech, and it would all of a sudden become an AME Zion church. And even though Turner tried to fight this phenomenon, he just uh, wasn't successful there. But the question that I had to ask was why. Uh, one of the reasons that I hypothesized is because Bishop James W. Hood actually is the first or became the first grand master of the Prince Hall Masonic order in North Carolina. And I do believe that to some degree that that may have played a role in it, his popularity within the Masonic fraternity. Uh, these two actually did meet and settle their differences. Although Turner uh, admitted his defeat, he was, I think he was a little hurt by that, but he still admitted his respect and admiration for Bishop Hood because of their affiliation with the Masonic fraternity. Uh, moving forward, um, again, I'm not going to rehearse every, you know, all, all the details to you for, for time's sake. Bishop Turner was very active uh, in the community, as you can see here, advocating for Black rights as a legislator. His back to Africa advocacy, anti-lynching advocacy were all very important things to his work and to his ministry. Um, I found, thanks to Dr. Johnson with the Henry McNeil Turner Project, um, I found a very interesting instance where he, where he talks about his uh, appreciation for the Masonic fraternity, where Bishop Turner says, and I quote, a remarkable incident and one worthy of notice occurred here while conversing with some white friends. They observed the square and compass, which I wear, and that's the Masonic emblem, uh, uh, which I have in my ring here, um, which I wear upon my bosom. Not being aware of its design, they requested to, to walk aside to explain to them why I carried such emblems upon my person. But as soon as I made the object known, they seemed to consider me settled to their special aid and protection. And they come and, and every comfort was instantly pledged to me. Now we're talking about white men in the South. And I think this was in Georgia when he wrote this in the South, pledging some type of loyalty and fealty to a black man and a radical black man. That why? Because of the importance of the Masonic fraternity to across the color line, even though that wasn't always necessarily the case. Uh, Turner would later transfer his Masonic membership to Pythagoras Lodge Number Eleven uh, in Savannah, Georgia, where it would remain for the rest of his life. Uh, he was very active in the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Georgia. Uh, he, draft, whoops, he drafted a um, resolution on the death of Lewis Hayden, who was Grand Master of the state of Massachusetts. Uh, he also served as a chaplain for a very important conference in Black Masonic history. I won't bore you with the details, but the 1877 conference uh, in Delaware, where there was a, a fight between what was known as the National Grand Lodge and uh, the Independent Grand Lodges. Bishop Turner serves as the chaplain of that event representing the state of Mississippi, which was headed by, at that time, Grand Master Thomas Stringer, the minister who I mentioned earlier. So you can see, again, these multiple layers. Um, as I begin to close, um, I will share uh, one anecdote with you all that's very important for me personally. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to Reverend um, William Jefferson Hightower. Uh, Reverend Hightower was a minister in Alabama um, back in the uh, 1800s and the early, up to the 1930s. And uh, Reverend Hightower is, in fact, my great, great, great grandfather. He was an AME minister uh, in the southeastern corner of the state. And as you can see here, I'm sorry, one of the lines got messed up. But as you see here, uh, the Montgomery Advertiser shows that Bishop Turner ordained, uh, he, right here, if you can see my mouse, W.J. Hightower, among a list of others, 
Uh, but I found other instances where, Re where Reverend Hightower and Bishop Turner interacted. Um, and I was very proud to find out that my ancestor uh, was a student of Bishop Turner's. And, and, and we can talk about that if anyone has any more questions um, in the Q&A. Um, lastly, and, and by the way, Reverend Hightower was a Prince Hall Mason as well. Um, lastly, um, like father, like sons, Bishop Turner passed his um, Masonic, his love for the Masonic fraternity on to his sons. So you see him with, with, uh, with his two sons. His son, Dr. John Payne Turner, who you see here uh, with the mustache, uh, actually would grow up to become a, a grand master of the, the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of DC where my membership is here today. And I'm sure that he got his love for the Masonic fraternity from his father who was such a very active advocate for it. Um, with that being said, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, James. Um, you all, that was uh, awesome. Um, just uh, thinking about like how small of a world it is. Um, I learned um, about um, Henry McNeil Turner, of course, through the, my work with the museum, uh, which I neglected to introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of who I am, I'm the Director of Education for the African American Civil War Museum. Uh, I've been with the museum for uh, 10 years, and um, I'm also joined on um, this uh, meeting with my colleague, uh, Edwin Gassaway, who's been with the museum for about eight years. Um, I may be wrong on that. Um, I think I'm right. But anyway, he's been with the museum for eight years and he does um, a That's lot of right. tech stuff <laughs> and uh, a lot of the, you know, operational stuff that, you know, basically you know, nobody really wants to do. Um, I kind of make the exhibit seem a little bit easier uh, for the, <laughs> the, the rest of the world. Um, so my introduction to Henry McNeil Turner came through the museum. Um, however, I was surprised to learn in uh, researching my own ancestor who was uh, in uh, the 103rd United States Colored Troops that uh, he attended, um, him and his wife attended um, Henry McNeil Turner's church. Uh, and he um, signed, uh, well, wrote out an affidavit um, for my ancestor's wife, uh, Celia Jefferson, um, when she, um, put in an application for her husband's pension who died in the war. Um, so it's, you know, always strikes me what a small world it is, um, and, you know, and how we all like move and, you know, interact amongst each other. There have been a lot of comments um, through the chat line and I will try to get uh, to address, uh, you know, as many of them as I can. Um, there are a few questions um, that I wanted to kind of like highlight. Um, Henry McNeil Turner does have some time, he was all over the place. He was in Washington, D.C. for a time period, and he uh, was instrumental in the growth of the first United States Colored Troops here in Washington, D.C. Um, but largely a lot of, and of course that was connected to uh, a church here in DC because he, that's why he was in Washington, DC. Um, there was one question that I'm trying to find here um, about his, let's start with the ones about his background. Uh, so there was a gentleman that asked about um, basically McNeil Turner's um, parents, uh, whether his mom was white, his uh, father was black um, and he had four wives and 14 children by his first wife. Uh, so James, I know that you and I have talked a lot about Henry McNeil Turner's um, family. So why don't you take that question? Oh, the person asked, did he have 14 children? Did he have 14 children with his first wife? I don't think he had 14. Um, the ones that I focus on are his sons, uh, John and, uh, and David. And I'm trying to remember if he had any daughters. I don't know mm -hmm. about 14 children. Um, he does have a very interesting family background as far as um, uh, his, his ethnic heritage goes um, in that, if I'm not mistaken, Dr. Johnson, please uh, correct me if I, if I err. Um, Turner's, fa Turner's father, I believe, was supposed to be the son of a white plantation owner in South Carolina, if I'm not mistaken. And through his, am I, am I, Dr. Johnson, am I, am I going off? No, 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 go ahead. Yeah, no, oh, that, okay. that's fine. Yeah, um, uh -huh. yeah. Handy. And, I believe, if I'm, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of his grandfathers was supposed to have been an African prince, and that's and even if that's not true, Turner himself believed that that was that that right. was true. But because of his descent from this uh, white white woman, his, his white grandmother, who he lived, who he grew up on the uh, uh, plantation of, that's why Turner was actually born free. 
Um, that's actually an area of Turner's life as far as uh, his, his childhood and whatnot that I'm very interested in and I've tried and I haven't been very successful, but I'm very interested to know what that was like and more about this, this grandmother of his and everything, but I haven't been as successful. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. uh, so this question, um, Dr. Johnson, um, I am shooting your way. Uh, a um, Bishop Richardson asked, um, what of Turner's assertion that God is the Negro? Right, yeah. Um, and I spent chapter two talking about that, actually. Um, the God is the Negro editorial that he wrote um, in 1898 in the voice of mission. Uh, but where he really uh, began uh, espousing it was in 1895 in a sermon um, that he delivered um, at the um, First Baptist Convention. Uh, mm -hmm. And it just goes to show you the um, Turner's um, ecclesiastical and eclectic um, positioning uh, and, and his wherewithal that he could do that. Um, Turner um, is, is, is making a declarative statement not literally saying that God is black, but trying to get black people to believe and to understand that if you cannot see yourself, uh, if you're a person of faith and you cannot see yourself as uh, made in the image of the creator, uh, there is like, there's really, really then, um, um, there's always going to be frustration. There's no hope. He literally says there's no hope for you. That's that's his, his language. And because everything, and, and this, is, this is what I get into, like I said, in chapter two, but I really talk about how Turner is really beginning to understand racism on a different level, not just prejudice, not just bad deeds, but how racism is baked into everything in the country, language. Uh, institutions, churches, the church hymnal, everything. And he's beginning to extrapolate. And he's one of the first ones early on that begins to actually do that. So his whole declaration, God is a Negro, was a stance to say that if you as a white person, he's talking to uh, white theologians at the time and white ministers, can believe that God is this fine, asymmetrical looking nicely robed white man. I have every right to believe that God is a thick-lipped black man. <laughs> and so with, with kinky hair and all of the features of blackness. And when you begin to do that, you begin to expose what other stuff uh, going on in the language that is being oppressive. Why is everything that's black bad and evil and everything that's good and, 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 and right with the world is white. And that's what Turner begins to do um, right around 1895, really starts in 1893 when he declared that Adam and Eve were black. And he talked about, you know, uh, um, um, talking about creation and the whole creation narratives. And so he gets in some trouble there and then he just, you know, well, I'm in, I'm in the hot water here. Let me just make it hotter. God is a Negro, how about that? So. <laughs> So and 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 Turner is really exploring religion and theology. He's he's doing some cutting edge work, actually. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Dr. Cole, um, I have a question here that was in the chat box um, about. Uh, Henry McNeil Turner being the first um, African American officer. Can you speak on that? Yeah. So you know, everybody likes to find first. I guess is what I would say. <laughs> um, but you know, I was not able to substantiate that. Um, and the closest I could get was that he was one of the first. Um, I think um, Edwin Redkey. I think um, did the research on this and and found that I think there were three chaplains who were. Uh, who were appointed right around the same time, maybe at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. I think Garland White was one. Um, and I don't know. I think there was one other. Um, mm -hmm. Dr. Johnson, maybe you know. Probably James Hunter. Yeah, maybe James. Hunter. Yeah, maybe James. But I think James Hunter was actually in um, 
I don't know. Um, anyway, I don't know who exactly they were, but there were several of them that were all kind of appointed at the same time. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, and I think it's always, you know, people want to find the first, but in the end, it doesn't really matter that much, you know? Um, <laughs> so well, I think that's I, where I ended up with it. Right. And, 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 and I feel, um, and I do, I'm, yeah, I saw that and I and, and, um, looked at that research. But I came on the side because I do say first in, in my works. And the reason why is because I fall on the side of the African-American chaplains now, the ones that, you know, um, the, the group that says that they honor Turner as being the first. So um, I went back in the history and then I brought it up because I was really wrestling with that. I didn't know what to, how to say it. And, and when I reached out to them, they recognized Turner as the first. So his paperwork might have been the first one signed by Lincoln, I, you know, in a stack, you know. <laughs> so, so I don't know, but but you're right. I mean, those- There is uh, a um, newspaper article that uh, talks about him being the first. And I actually did an exercise with some kids um, mm-hmm. in high school here in DC, uh, where we were talking about newspapers as like, you know, you know primary source yes they are a primary source but they can also get it in true as well um you know that might have been like henry mcneil turner got his papers into the media first and was like right. write me down as the first <laughs> well, I I just, the you, you don't know <laughs> well, i just no, kept, the people i'll go well i was just gonna say that you know my suspicion was that henry mcneil turner got to say he was first when he became bishop you know <laughs> or no well, even well, you have a point because he was writing and he was writing a whole lot. He probably, yeah, but, but yeah, so. Well, well, well the one, one thing I would add to this conversation as well is we have to remember that at the time we talk about the Civil War, Turner is the minister here in Washington, D.C. So he also has proximity to, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the national papers and whatnot uh, from, that were local to this area. So I think that's, yeah. that's another aspect as well you have to think about. Exactly. It's like, you know, there's, you know, over 100 um, USCT regiments, but everybody knows the 54th Massachusetts because they had a really great PR agent um, during the Civil War and they were well written about and, you know, everything. So people know about the 54th Massachusetts more than any other regiment. Um, Just to make sure that I get in as many of the comments um, and questions that I can, I have one from a Todd Roulette here. that he is asking um, if any of the panelists um, can say if there is anything similar between Masonic Lodges and the CME Church. His uh, paternal grandfather and grandmother were Masonic members, staunch members of a Southern CME Church in South Chicago suburbs in the 50s. Mm. So I guess that would be for me, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I would say you, you can find... Um, you know, some some similar cross comparisons across a lot of you know different black denominations, but it's not going to be quite like the AME Church. And the only reason why I say that is because the AME Church is established at the same formative period as Prince Hall Freemasonry is, and so you may find some things locally, what have you. Maybe there's more research to be done that I'm just not aware of. But it's not going to be like the AME Church just because. I mean, when when you when you get into Prince Hall Freemasonry, the, the name Prince Hall is actually after a, a, a person. He was the first master of African Lodge. Well, Prince Hall, like I said, he actually knew and corresponded and worked with uh, Reverend Absalom Jones and Bishop Allen. And so it's just it, it's just one of those things where they, like I, I call them twin sisters because both organizations literally grow up at the same time right next to each other, basically. Um, so I don't think you'll find it quite the same, but maybe you will. Uh, maybe you will find something I'm just not aware of. Okay, um, thank you, James. Um, so I have a question here. Um, sorry, I'm not catching the name. Um, in respect to Bishop Turner's essay and Daniel Wallace's, Wallace Culp's work, as Turner spoke about many corruptions in the United States government, um, from the study that you have done on Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, could you speak to the approach he may have taken today in regards to the most current insurrection on the Capitol? Um, yeah, that's a heavy one. Yeah. Anybody want to take that one? <laughs> oh, no, t- oh. <laughs> Turner would I got something to say, uh, but I'm not speaking after I'm not speaking before Dr. John. No, go ahead. Go ahead, James. You can do it. 
I see another I'm reminded question. Of, <laughs> I, I, I'm reminded of uh, back in the 60s when, when Malcolm X said, talked about chickens coming home to roost. Um, right. I, I think Turner's, I think he may have found a little bit of humor in, in what happened, but I also think that he also would have said, you know, in a nutshell, that what goes around comes around. You, you, you planted these seeds and now the vines have grown up and choked you. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he would have said something like that in, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I agree. And, and and Turner would have not have been surprised. This is, he would have alerted us to the rhetoric earlier, mm-hmm. you know, um, as many people who were trying to tell folk, I mean, um, when we can just go all the way back, you can, you can go all the way back uh, um, to 2000, but if you just want to, you know, put it in a Trump era when Trump comes down, uh, came down the escalator and when he made his announcement, that was the beginning of, I mean, so yeah, Turner would have been, would have been on it. I firmly yeah. believe he would have had a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think he would also say that it's not over? Um, you know, I think the fact that there hasn't been Well, you know, I mean, now all the Republicans are lining back up behind Trump, right? And I mean, to me, that would be evidence that it's baked in to a certain extent. Exactly. And that's, yeah, that's the point. Yeah, that the the analysis needs to go deeper. It is, Mm -hmm. it is like, this is just what it is. It is baked in. And what Turner's last 20 years, and this is my little 10 cent argument, I guess, Mainly his last 20 years, he is trying to get folk to see this, that if you, then you can govern yourself accordingly. Then you can act a certain way. You can um, um, reclaim agency. And one of the, I mean, you know, we we talk about um, his immigration rhetoric and everybody like, you know, hey, you know, it didn't work. It was a failure. He shouldn't have done all of this, that and the other. Well, two things, A, whole lot of people did immigrate, you know, you know, um, you know, everybody gives Marcus Garvey, you know, the back to Africa movement. Garvey mm-hmm. didn't go to Africa, nor did he lead anyone to Africa. Mm-hmm. Turner did and went four times. That's one. But the second one is that he put a spirit into a lot of folk in the South and they couldn't get to Africa, didn't have the money, but they showed left and they showed went as far as their money took them. So when they were trying to get away, maybe I just, you know, if I'm in Mississippi, I can make it to Memphis, you know? And if I'm in Memphis, maybe I can make it to St. Louis. And, you know, those are the type of uh, um, things that, that you, when you listen or read some of the testimonies of some of the migrants, they'll mm-hmm. talk about, you know, hearing a Bishop Turner or hearing certain preachers preaching some of the same type of sermons and rhetoric that Bishop Turner yeah, and that gave them the ability to say, hey, I, I think I can reclaim my agency. Things are not going to get better here. Let me go to try and do something else. So, Yeah, um, I feel that uh, Turner, um, like many figures during the time period, um, is so complex in you know his language but also the com- concepts that he kind of tackled um yeah. and in a way he was a little bit ahead of his time with uh some things that he embraced um i have one question here that um, brings that to mind um someone asked can you elaborate on um turner's advocating of women in the clergy yep i'm working on an article now about that <laughs> And Turner and his uh, and the role of women in his life and um, just a fascinating thing. As much as a 19th century preacher could be, black preacher could be as uh, womanist or feminist or whatever term you want to use or pro womanist as 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 one could be at that time. Turner Steele had he was a product of his time, of course, mm-hmm. but as far as you know, not only just ordaining uh, Sarah Ann Hughes in 1885, that was, you know, that's the obvious one. Mm -hmm. Um, But he allowing women to run his newspapers when he went to Africa, for instance, they became the editors. Publishing a lot of women, um, shouting out a lot of women, you know, saying their names, putting their names like this woman here, 
thought the world of Ida B. Wills. He thought the world of Holly Quinn Brown. Try to marry Holly Quinn Brown. She turned him down and said, no, I want to do. And she, he was like, yeah, you better off doing this than being with me. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> that'll slow you down. Yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, and, and being so respectful to women um, that inspired him, that motivated him, that chastised him. He's one in 1865, um, he's writing about um, uh, a woman by the name of Mary Harden, who used to give him advice and criticisms and, and helpful hints about his sermon. And he allowed that. And he talked when she passes on. He said that this is the woman that made me the preacher I am today. She worked with me on my grammar. She worked with me on my sermons. And everybody will say, Pre, uh, uh, Pastor, you did a good job. But then when she came, she was like, I just shook my head because I knew that um, she would find something uh, at fault. But it made him, and he, he didn't have to publicize it. He didn't have to write about that. But Turner did all of that. So um, uh, one of the things that we can learn from Turner, if nothing else, is you know how to be an ally, how to be supportive of women in the ministry as a whole, and how to be uh, um, supportive of women um, in public. Um, period. Even when he started his Lyceum in 1862, there was a woman that he invited and made sure that women get an opportunity to speak and to present and to uh, recite their poetry and their uh, essays as well. And this is 1862, 1863. So um, given a pass, trying to pass a bill in 1868 when he was at the state legislature to women to vote. vote. He wrote a bill like women should have the right to vote in 1868. Of course, it never reached the floor. And then, of course, he was trying to get back into the state legislature after they kicked him out. But the point is that we do have that on record as well, too. So Turner is um, very much, very much um, uh, a person that supported and advocated um, women's autonomy um, in total. Mm -hmm. OK. Um... Being that uh, basically, um, you know, there's so much to Turner's life that's applicable in several different things, um, the Civil War, uh, Reconstruction, um, you know, even, the, you know, the women's movement um, with voting and whatnot. Um, I would have to ask this question as an educator, how could I sculpt this uh, figure for the K through 12 classroom? And any one of y'all can well, take that. <laughs> well, for me, I think that it's important to um, highlight Black narratives, especially as it concerns the Civil War. Um, growing up, I mean, I don't even think, I mean, Glory came out, I'm pretty sure Glory came out the year I was born, I think. And I don't remember if I had to watch that in high school or, or middle school or what. I, I might have had to see it in middle school, maybe. But, that, but I went to a Black middle school. So I think trying to make his life more um, visible for the K-12 audience, especially um, when we talk about civil war and reconstruction, because oftentimes what happens is in, in, in history, white people get to be individuals and have their individual stories told and remembered. Black people get remembered as a group, if at all. And so uh, we get remembered as slaves, we get remembered as workers, we get remembered as all these things, but pick out you know, your Bishop Turners of the world, your Ida B. Wells of the world. Um, but particularly around the Civil War, I think that his story, the fact that we not only know his story, we have the documents, but we have his words, thanks to Dr. Cole and to Dr. Johnson. And we can actually see what was he thinking? What was he experiencing? I mean, to me, those, I mean, you can draw up, you know, a whole week's worth of activities and assignments just based on that alone and thinking about what Turner's um, experience was and how it would relate particularly to black children, but children in general, um, mm -hmm. when you're dealing with the civil war, I think it's very important uh, in that aspect. So I, um, I guess I would say that in my, I mean, wh when I've taught Turner, I've actually talked about, you know, this dichotomy between um, Booker T. Washington and um, W.B. Du Bois, as though they're the only two African-American thinkers. And, you know, and I think that reflects a kind of like binary, binarist kind of thinking that either you accommodated or you assimilated, right? And, and 
Um, and Turner was actually talking about something totally different. I mean, he was talking about like, well, what if, like, what if we just don't talk about the white people? Like, well, you know, why don't we just talk about black identity for itself? Um, and so when I teach um, Turner, I actually talk about a three-legged stool and what would black history look like if we actually included the voices of black thinkers who, um, who didn't respond, who were not just responding to white thinkers and to a white public, you know? Um, and so I think that's one, something that he really has to offer. Um, you know, and, and you think about, you know, people like Martin Delaney, who also doesn't really get a lot of attention um, in literature classes or in history classes. Everybody talks about Douglas. Um, you know, and I think the people who have, have taken a more kind of militant approach um, have been excluded from history. And when Turner became really pessimistic about the United States, that's when he got kind of got written out, um, you know, out of both African American history and American history. So I think telling that story about how his um, perspective just didn't really fit in with, uh, you know, I think um, Dr. Johnson was talking about the, the moral suasion argument and the uplift suasion um, argument, which really came to dominate the 20th century. Um, he was so much more important than that. And, and so I found it shocking how he was just kind of written out. I find mm -hmm. that um, sometimes when um, you, you look at these historical figures and you're, you're breaking down their, their thoughts through what they're writing, um, something stood out to me, what you said about um, Henry McNeil Turner's uh, feelings about where the country was at the time period um, kind of mirrors a lot of people's uh, feelings about um, where we are as a nation today. Um, and I think that there's a lot to learn um, from that, especially since he used his words um, and his actions to try to like, you know, enact some, some change in his time period. Mm -hmm. um, I would just, oh. Go ahead. Can I just, real quick, I was, I mean, I think a, a K through 12 curriculum could easily, especially in these days and times right now, talking about Turner as citizen. Um, what does it mean to be citizen? And, and his earlier oratory was all about that. Tr finding um, that whole 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, finding his place as a citizen to then be able to declare and proclaim what it was that he wanted to declare and proclaim. So studying him as citizen mm -hmm. would be important, I think. Okay, so I have, um, I'll take one more question. I have a um, gentleman that wanted to know um, about interactions between Booker T. Washington and um, Henry McNeil Turner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were good friends, but they, they, they sparred, they were like, I mean, they were going at it, you know, you're talking about, you know, um, playing the dozens and, and stuff like that, you know, he and Douglas as well, too. You know, Douglas. Um, uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, they, they, they had some major disagreements because, of course, um, um, Booker T. Washington was not, you know, an immigrationist. Um, and he thought Turner was um, long winded, or full of hot air, just, you know, nobody's going to listen to you and your crazy ideas and whatever. When um, um, Washington gave his famous 1895 Atlanta Compromise speech, Turner wrote uh, the next day that Mr. Washington will have to live a long time to undo the harm that he did to our race in that mm -hmm. one speech. And, um, and then, you know, it just takes off. But in 1906, 1907, it was Washington coming to the aid of Turner because President uh, Roosevelt at the time was going to um, um, bring him up for uh, on treason charges because he called the flag a dirty and contemptible rag and he damned America, you know. And um, it was Turner that wrote to Roosevelt and in a kind of a playful but serious way, you know, just let it slide, Mr. President. You know, nobody listened to him anyway. He's an old man and, you know, and just, just, you know. So in other words, he interceded on the behalf and nothing really happened after that. Um, so their, their friendship 
and their rivalry, their debates in the in the public, um, uh, and the letters that they they corresponded with uh, mm -hmm. attest to a friendship, but also major disagreements, which then going back to uh, Professor Cole's point, highlights the intellectual acumen that we just kind of sometimes gloss over that these people were having some real debates and they both were making some good points and they were trying to do point counterpoint. So, yeah. Absolutely. If, if I can piggyback on that real quickly um, on that question, um, both, both Turner and Booker T. Washington were both Prince Hall Freemasons. And I meant to mention that earlier uh, when Dr. Cole was talking about David Walker and Martin Delaney um, as well, uh, that Turner and Washington were in that same network. Um, the other thing that I wanted to, uh, to, to mention very quickly that someone brought up to me a while back when I was thinking about um, this discussion about Turner, Du Bois and, and Washington is you have to remember one thing. Turner was old enough to be the father of both Booker T. Washington and Du Bois. And so, and so when, when, when you see the debates in the back and forth, some of that is also intergenerational discussion. Uh, du Bois was not enslaved at all. Booker T. Washington had been born in slavery, but he didn't experience slavery like Turner. Now, Turner was not enslaved. He was a free man, but let's be clear, he was still born in South Carolina in 1834. He's already a grown man by the time slavery is over, and he did work the fields with enslaved people. So, so there's a different understanding of the world. And so just as I'm James Morgan III talking to you today, born in 1989, you know, I just got off the phone with James Morgan Jr., my father, not too long ago, earlier today. There's some things that he and I disagree on just based upon the fact of when we were born. And so, and I do think that there's some of that aspect as well. Matter of fact, I think that both, both Washington and... Um, Du Bois, if I'm not mistaken, uh, both referred to Turner as a bumbling old man and all these type of, you know, they used to crack ages type of jokes on him, but that's because he was old enough to be their father. And that's something we also have to keep into account um, as well when we look at some of these type of debates. Some of it is intergenerational as well. And I'm gonna say this as a young person, I'm gonna be quiet. Young people, we do have a, uh, um, to take the reins and move and, and move things forward, but there is still an aspect of sit back and listen to your elders and take in what they're saying as well. And I think that that's some, some discussion that, that maybe should have been had at that time as, uh, as well. Right, good point. Um, so um, do you have, do you, any of you have any final points that you wanted to um, share with us before um, we bring well, this? Well, I would just like to say real quick, I mean, uh, other than I was look, just looking at the chat and I recognize some of the, um, AME bishops are, are in the Zoom room. I just want to shout them out and just say uh, thank you for you know all that you do and for the AME church. I mean, Professor Cole talked about the Christian recorder. What we know about 19th century Black church history, what we know about uh, a lot of the people and a lot of the mannerisms and a lot of everything from the 19th century is uh, part and parcel because the ME Church um, kept alive the newspapers of the Christian Recorder. And um, the Recorder is still going on to this day. So I am just so thankful as a person who studies Bishop Turner, as a person who studies Black church history, as a person that studies um, 19th century rhetoric, I am thankful um, for the uh, AME Church and the bishops who um, um, kept uh, alive that tradition. So thank you. And I just wanted to just shout you out because I see some of you in the uh, chat and some of you on, on the participant line there. Thanks, Bishop. Are the Christian Recorder records um, available online or easily accessible? Yeah, they're, um, yeah. they're on microfilm. And then they're also, um, oh, what's the archive? Um, uh, accessible archives. Yes, accessible archives, accessible archives. Um, is a database that has them, but they're just—it's just text. It's not the actual facsimiles of the newspapers. I, I, actually, correction, Dr. Cole, you can get the actual ones, but you have to know how to do it on the website. But it, it is on there. Yeah, yeah. I can show you that off offline. I can show you. I figured that out. You speaking to age yet again, right? <laughs> These young ripper snappers, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they hide it pretty good on that website, but you actually can access it though. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, Miss Chitty, uh, oh. I'm A.J. Richardson and A.M.E. Bishop, and it's been our joy to be with you tonight. Oh, thank you, Bishop. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, Dr. Cole, did you have anything that you wanted, any final thoughts you wanted to leave us with? No, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I mostly speak to literature people. And it has been so much fun to, especially just reading the chat and seeing all of this interest in church history. You know, I can't convince anyone to listen to me talk about, <laughs> about <laughs> church stuff. So um, yeah, so it's been really eye-opening for me and I'm so happy to see this interest in, in the AME church and the history behind it and Turner, it's just thrilling. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. And James? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I would like to say again, you know, I'd like to echo uh, Dr. Johnson, Dr. Cole. This has been amazing. I'm thrilled to see so many of our AME bishops and uh, clergy um, out this evening. Um, I am, I actually was born and raised as a Baptist, uh, but my family has the deep AME roots, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and so uh, I do consider Bishop Turner to be an adopted ancestor of mine. Uh, and for the reason, and the reason being is that literally if he didn't assign Reverend Hightower where he assigned him so he can be his wife, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you all this evening. So, I, I'm, so, so, thank you, Bishop Turner, for that. You know, as well, he's, he's, he, y'all can blame in part, y'all can blame him for this. Um, but this has been thrilling, um, and I do want to encourage everybody to please get uh, support uh, Dr. Cole and Dr. Johnson's uh, books. I have them all, um, and uh, I definitely. I don't think we mentioned the Henry McNeil Turner Project uh, website, but please make sure you check out the Henry McNeil Turner Project online. Um, as well. Mm -hmm. um, all three of us have been contributing to that uh, under the leadership of Dr. Johnson. And, uh, and anything you want to learn on Bishop Turner, if it's not there, it, it, you know, please send it to us so we can put it there. Um, but other than that, I'm just thankful to, to be a part of this and, and wish everybody a happy Black History Month. And happy birthday, Bishop Turner. Yep. Well, I thank all three of you uh, for taking time out of your evening. I know y'all could be reading a good book, um, especially your own, if the publisher had to send it to you first. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, wait, but, wait, go uh, on. Can, I, can, I, can, I, can I cut in real, real quick with that one since you mentioned it uh, yeah, twice? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, so, so as was mentioned earlier, Dr. Johnson's latest book is No Future in This Country. And <laughs> I made sure to reserve a copy of it when it, when it when it first came out. And literally I got a copy like a month early i got the copy before he had it so that's so y'all wonder why she keeps saying that it's because this is the first copy that to hit the street i had it <laughs> and so and you know they sent them and they only send out the, those early copies to the uh influential people so you know james morgan is the is the inf <laughs> I, but look, I, I have an uncle i have an uncle in russia I'll, I'll put you on to touch with him i'll put you on to touch with my uncle in russia <laughs> So uh, we, uh, again, I thank all of y'all uh, for participating in this. Um, this is the first event that we'll be having this month. Um, the second one um, actually is this week, February 4th, uh, with Chris Haley's Reflections on uh, Roots, and it's um, largely about genealogy, so I hope uh, some of you will be able to make it. Uh, same time, not the same bad channel. Um, but definitely on Zoom. Uh, so if you're able to make that, it will be uh, great to have you um, with us on that time period. And again, as always, if you're curious about um, some of the stuff that we do at the museum, uh, please check out our website at afroamcivilwar.org. Um, we take donations as well um, because most of our programming is free. Uh, admissions is free uh, when we're not in a pandemic situation, but you know how it is. Uh, but we'll get past that. And when we get past this pandemic, you guys will have a bright and shiny new exhibit um, space um, because we're under renovation right now. So um, we'll definitely look forward to seeing many of you in person uh, when we get past this scary situation here. So um, definitely thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. Miss Chitty. Yes. One more thing. Mm -hmm. A seminary is named after Henry McNeil Turner. It's attached to the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that today and tomorrow, Turner Seminary is celebrating its Founders Day. Oh. Uh, so that's going on right now as we speak. Uh, so how appropriate is that? All right. I happen to be a graduate. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in 2022, 2023, we might have to do the uh, the next annual, 
Bishop Turner Symposium uh, there live once we pass this pandemic. We, we're going to speak that into existence, Bishop. All right. Well, again, thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night.